Hey guys, welcome to my video on kidney stones. In this video, we'll discuss different types of kidney stones, and then at the end, certain ways to prevent forming stones. So stick around to the end of the video for those solutions. Let's talk about the different types first. Now, by far the most common kidney stone is the calcium oxalate stone. And as the name implies, it has two components, calcium and oxalate, both of which we get from our diet. Calcium comes from cow's milks and cheeses mainly, and then oxalate comes from spinach, rhubarb, uh, chocolate, and other plant products. Now, these aren't the only sources of calcium and oxalate. They're just some of the main ones. Oxalate in plants actually is used to take calcium out of the plant system so that it doesn't calcify. So as you can tell from that natural system, they love to bind each other. When calcium and oxalate are together, they're not a problem. You eat them, they stay in your GI tract, and you poop them out. You don't absorb as much of them as you would otherwise. The problem becomes when they're absorbed in disproportionate amounts or absorbed separately. Let's talk about situations where they're absorbed too much. In irritable bowel disease like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, the gut wall becomes very leaky. There's spaces in there, there's irritation, there's inflammation. And what likes to sneak through those spaces is oxalate. Now you have way too much oxalate in your bloodstream and the main filtration system of the body is the kidney. So it's going to try to get rid of that oxalate, pumping it into the kidney tubules. And that oxalate is now going to bind to calcium and form a stone. So people with IBD are predisposed predisposed to calcium oxalate stones. Next, let's talk about vitamin C. Vitamin C is often highly praised and people are taking a lot of it, but it can predispose you to calcium oxalate stones in actually two ways. One, it's converted to oxalate in the body. So after you eat it, it goes to oxalate and then you have to pee out that oxalate. So calcium oxalate stones can form there. Two, it creates an acidic environment. So vitamin C is also known as ascorbic acid. When this acidic environment forms, calcium oxalate likes to precipitate. Guess who gets rid of the acid in your body too? Your kidney, right? So whenever you are acidic, whenever your blood is acidic, it's going to want to pee that acid out, forms acidic environment inside the kidney tubules, and then you can form a stone. So vitamin C can predispose to stones and should be just taken in a normal dose if you have a predisposing stone forming condition, or you've formed multiple of these stones in the past. The next one we can talk about is ethylene glycol. This is found in antifreeze. Um, ethylene glycol is often eaten by children and pets because it has a sweet flavor and it creates something called metabolic acidosis. So it creates a lot of acid inside of your body. And guess who gets rid of that acid? The kidney. And when you have an acidic environment, you form calcium oxalate stones. After that, we have vitamin B6. Vitamin B6 has been shown in pre many studies that it helps reabsorb calcium inside the kidney. So when calcium enters the kidney, it has two options, either to get reabsorbed into the body or to stay in the tubule and get excreted. The calcium that forms stones is the one that stays in the tubule and gets excreted. So if B6 is gone, we have calcium not being reabsorbed, more of it staying in the tubule and then getting excreted and more likely to form stones. So if you have a calcium oxalate forming stone, stone forming condition, taking a sup daily supplement of vitamin B6 could prove helpful for you. And it's a water soluble vitamin, so it's fairly safe because if you take too much of it, you'll just pee it out. Next thing we have on the list is citrate. Citrate is very important. It comes from citrus fruits, like oranges, for example. And what it does is in the kidney tubule where our stones form, it likes to bind calcium. And when it binds calcium, it takes it away from oxalate. So now we can have this insoluble calcium oxalate complex forming. Instead, we have calcium citrate forming, which is soluble and is not going to form stones. So very important to have enough citrate in the diet. Next, we have uric acid. And as the name implies, it is an acid, so it will create an acidic environment inside our tubule, predisposing us to stones. And so we've covered calcium oxalate now in sufficient detail about the predisposing factors. Here in our bottom diagram, we have a, a microscopic description of calcium stones. There are those square-like um, stones with the cross pattern. So many people say they look like little envelopes. And here on the top right, we have a big spike, spicy, spicy, spiky calcium oxalate stone. And as you can see, this probably hurts a lot and causes a lot of damage on its way out from the kidney. 
Next, we have calcium phosphate stones. These are very rare. Less than 5% of stones are calcium phosphate, but they're another type of calcium stone. So as with calcium oxalate, let's break this apart into two pieces. We have calcium and we have phosphate. Now, one of the hormones in the body that controls both calcium and phosphate is called parathyroid hormone. It's secreted by the four parathyroid glands in your neck. This hormone monitors calcium levels in the blood. When the calcium levels are too low, it increases, causing the bone to break down and more calcium to be released into the blood. This calcium can then be distributed to wherever it needs to go. It also has an action on phosphates because when bone breaks down, not only calcium gets released, but so does phosphate. And one of the extra actions of parathyroid glands are to increase the excretion of phosphate. So phosphate goes up in the blood and more out in the kidneys and calcium goes up in the blood. And as you can imagine, if you have high calcium in your blood, a little bit more is also going to get excreted. Okay, so we have our two components in our kidneys now to form our calcium phosphate stone by having high parathyroid function. These stones like to form in the alkaline environments or basic environments, unlike our calcium oxalate stones. So two ways in which you can get an alkaline environment uh, that predisposes for these stones. One is if you have a condition called renal tubular acidosis. Usually it's type one, which means the last part of your kidney or the distal end cannot excrete protons. When it can't do that, that means it retains a lot of acid. That's why it's called acidosis. And now your urine doesn't have any of those protons to be excreted, so you are going to have very basic urine. This predisposes to the stone formation. The second one is having a UTI. Now, bacteria don't like acidic environments, especially in the urinary tract. If they're trying to invade your urinary tract, they're going to make it suitable for them to live and they want to make it a basic environment. And they have all sorts of enzymes and tricks to do this. And this in turn will predispose you to forming these calcium phosphate stones because the urine is now more basic because the bacteria is living there. Next, let's move on to our third type of stone, which is uric acid. This is the second most type, most common type of kidney stone. And it's found in patients that have um, two conditions, either gout or cancer. So let's talk about gout first. Gout is a condition where purines are not appropriately metabolized and get gotten rid of. So when you eat a lot of meat, it's composed of uh, protein. Protein subunits are called amino acids. And a portion of those amino acids are under the group of purines. Now, if purines aren't appropriately metabolized, you build up a lot of uric acid in the system. This acid can precipitate and form crystals, which then can cause kidney stones. So having a high protein diet or having previous episodes of gout that hasn't, have not been treated can predispose you to forming these types of stones by having just too much uric acid in your system. The second way you can get high uric acid in your system is if you have a type of cancer, either a blood cancer where your cells are being recycled very fast, your white blood cells or red blood cells are being constantly recycled, or you're getting a cancer treatment. This is called tumor lysis syndrome, where a large mass of cells is being destroyed very fast. In that case, um, all these proteins that make up these cells are being released into your blood and the blood needs to do something with them, right? So all the purines from these cells are getting metabolized into uric acid and you're more likely to form stones. After that, we have dehydration, which is really applying to all stones. If you're dehydrated, you're more likely to precipitate a stone just because there's less water and the molecules that form these stones can be closer together because there's less solvent to keeping them apart and you're more likely to get a stone. These stones also, like calcium oxalate, form in acidic environments. And here we have a diagram on the right with these rhomboid-like stones. And a keynote here is they can have two shapes, either rhomboid or spiky. Next, we have ammonium magnesium phosphate stones. These are more commonly known as struvite or staghorn calculi. These stones form as a result of infection. So you have a bacteria in your urinary tract, it has an enzyme called urease, which breaks down urea into ammonia and CO2. Now that ammonia combines with magnesium and phosphate to create these really giant stones. If you see here on the diagram on the bottom, both of those giant white blotches are these stones. And here we can see the biopsy of it being taken out. They are really massive. They form in alkaline urine environments, so basic urine. 
as, as we talked before, bacteria like to live in basic environments too. And one of the things that can predispose you to forming these types of stones is having a catheter inserted into your urethra. So if you go to the emergency room, if you have any problem peeing, if you have a surgery, they will insert a catheter into your urethra to help you pee. Now, the problem is that catheter is going in the wrong direction and it's put, it can push bacteria up the urinary tract and cause them to infect your kidneys, which can form these types of stones. So it's good to have proper sterile catheter technique and to be wary of the history of these types of stones in people who are getting catheterized. Um, how the stones look like is over here on the bottom right. They have this rectangular shape um, and that's classic for them. So a rectangular shaped stone. Next, we have cysteine stones. These are really the stones of childhood. So in any child with a kidney stone, you have to suspect this type of stone. It's a genetic disorder where cysteine does not get reabsorbed in the kidney tubule. So it stays there. And what cysteine loves to do in the kidney tubule is to precipitate. It combines together and forms these hexagonal-like structures, which we can see on the bottom right. This is an autosomal recessive disease, which means both the parents have to be carriers. To, in order to have a child with the disease. And these types of stones like to precipitate in alkaline environments or basic urine. Next, we have uh, penicillamine, which, is, which can be used in these types of stones to chelate out the cysteine or bind it and prevent them from forming stones. That's just a quick treatment um, aside. Okay, so if you have a stone in a child, you should suspect a cysteine stone uh, at, on the differential at least. Next, we have stones that are created by drugs. So many drugs have this side effect of potentially creating a kidney stone. Uh, here on the list, we have acyclovir, which is used for viral infections, herpes, for example, and zoster, uh, indinavir, which is used in HIV, antibiotics like sulfonamides, fluoroquinolones, and ceftriaxone. All these drugs can precipitate and form stones if the person isn't properly hydrated. So maintaining proper hydration with these drugs is very important. Um, on top of that, we have drugs that can alter the um, acidity or the elements found in urine that create more stones. So cetazolamide, for example, uh, it's used to, in mountain sickness, it, it creates a more alkaline urine environment. So it can predispose to certain types of stones. Furosemide is a diuretic, which can alter uh, the proton excretion in the kidney tubule. Uh, topiramate is a seizure drug, which can, again, alter the urine environment and predispose to stones. Um, I'll have to look into exactly which types of stones those are, but just be aware of that side effect. Vitamin D creates um, higher absorption of calcium and phosphate in the GI tract. And if you have high calcium and phosphate in your system, you are more likely to excrete more calcium or more phosphate into your renal system and more likely to form calcium stones like the two we talked about in this video. Next, we have aluminum magnesium hydroxide. This is used in constipation and it can alter the acid-base balance in the body and it can also contribute to magnesium stones if you have a predisposition for those. And finally, we have calcium. Now, this is uh, more... In, more referring to IV calcium rather than dietary. If you have IV calcium, it's harder to control the levels and they can spike really fast. So the kidney might have a higher load of calcium and excrete more of it if the calcium is IV. So just be careful with IV calcium and the calcium levels in order to not go overboard and predispose the patient to forming stones. Or if the patient is on IV calcium, I would watch out for stone formation and any, any potential signs of stones like um, back pain and things like that. Now we move on to the most important slide of this presentation, which is the preventative measures that can be done to stop stones. This is number one, hydration, greater than 2.5 liters of water per day or any, really any fluids, okay? So if you're drinking more than that per day, you're gonna have more solvent in your body. And with these particles being separated by more water, they're less likely to come into contact and form a stone. So it's very important to get hydrated to flush the system in order to prevent stones. Next, we have reduced salt intake. This is important because salt actually competes with calcium in the tubule for reabsorption. So if we have a lot of salt in our system, it's going to prefer to get reabsorbed, and that's going to leave calcium inside the tubule not reabsorbed. 
when it's not reabsorbed, it gets excreted. And during the excretion process is when we form stones. So reducing the salt diet to less than 1500 milligrams per day is crucial to stopping calcium stones. Next, we have a low protein diet. Now, I know you may be thinking low protein diet, that's the uric acid crystal stones, but it also contributes to our calcium stones. Why? Because protein, just like salt, competes with calcium for reabsorption, just a little bit. So if you have a lot of protein in your system, you're going to keep calcium inside the tubule because it's not going to get reabsorbed, and then it's going to form stones. So protein is something definitely to watch out for. Reducing protein in the diet is important. Next, reducing oxalate in the diet. That's to reduce calcium oxalate stones. So avoiding, avoiding oxalate-rich foods. We already talked about spinach, rhubarb, and chocolates, which are very high in oxalate. And the last part, in, and a very important misconception, is to not avoid eating calcium. If you avoid calcium-rich foods, or if you avoid calcium in general, you are more likely to form a calcium oxalate stone. That's because calcium is needed in your GI tract to bind oxalate. If you don't have calcium, you're going to reabsorb oxalate like crazy, and your kidney is still going to filter out any excess calcium in your body, so you will still form stones. So avoiding calcium is not the answer to resolving any kind of calcium stone. All right, and let's move on to our summary slide. Here we have uh, a general summary of all the types of stones we talked about and a little bit about each one, the crystal type, the radio opacity just refers to if it can be seen on x-ray or not. Uh, radio opaque means it can be, and radio lucent means it cannot. So calcium oxalate, for example, is radio opaque, so you can see it on x-ray. All right, I hope this video was helpful and you gained some information from it, and I will see you guys in the next one.